<laughs> All right, yeah, Tim, Tim, I done told you that the, the last few pages of my, my notes have uh, up and vanished. They've up and, uh, they've, they've just disappeared on me. They're, they're not there. I, they were there last night. I mean, I saw them. I read them. But this is a prime example. I, I once got a, I once got accused by, by someone of, uh, of standing here and reading my sermons word for word. I can tell you this, y'all better be thankful that I don't stand here and read them word for word. You better be very thankful for that. I typically have uh, anywhere from, um, from 10 to 15 pages of notes, so be very thankful that I, that I don't do that. I take a lot of notes for a reason when I do this, and times like this is going to be a great example. I've learned a long time ago that the worst ink that you can have is better than the than the greatest memory than you can have. And you know, I'm thinking that's that's one thing. I, I don't mind so much fumbling over words or or having a. Or, or having to go and actually turn to the Scripture that I want to read instead of regurgitating it from, from my brain. You know, I, I do have trouble memorizing Scripture. I, I, and it's, to be fair, even these songs that were up here that we're trying to play, there's a reason I'm not up here because I have trouble memorizing the songs and I have to be staring at it because I, I can't do it. And, and I have trouble even memorizing the notes that go with those songs. That's just one little letter that I've got to know and I can't remember to do that. So I have to have some kind of, some kind of note there. And I, I appreciate the notes. But, you know, I am so appreciative today that as my, part of my notes have disappeared on me, I'm so appreciative of the fact that I've got the perfectly preserved Word of God. I, I'm tickled to death to, to have access to that today. And I don't have to worry about it being, being taken away because God has done something that He said He would do and He has preserved it. So if you've got your Bibles, let's turn to, to Daniel chapter 10 and let's honor reading of the Word of God. Let's stand, stand and read the Word here. Somebody say amen when you got it. Amen. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hittakel, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded in the fine gold of Uphaz. His body was also like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in, like in color to polish brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were, that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me in corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then I was in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. And behold, a man touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken his word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to take thee, understand, 
I'm I'm come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. And when he had spoken such words to me, I set my face toward the ground and became dumb. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. For how can the servant of this my Lord talk with uh, with this, my Lord, for as me straightway there remained no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. Then there came again, and then there then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me and said, "O oh, man, greatly beloved, fear not, peace be unto thee, be strong, yea, be strong." And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, "Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me." Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to thee with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. But I will come. Uh, but I will show thee that which is noted uh, in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. Father God, Lord, we come to you, Lord, today in the name of Jesus, Lord, the name of all names, God. Lord, we just thank you today, Lord, for the reading and the hearing of your word. Lord, we just ask you to have your will and way with us, Lord. Allow us to learn from your word, Lord. Allow us to grow from your word, Lord. Lord, only allow us to do that if we seek you, God. God, if we're, if we're expecting something for nothing, don't even give it to us, God. But if we're, if we're willing to, to seek after you, God, we pray that you'll, that you'll be faithful as you always are, Lord, to meet us there, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for all that you do, Lord. We thank you so much for, for many things, Lord. Mostly, Lord, we thank you for sending your Son to die on the cross of Calvary for our sins. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now I'll be seated. So as we pick up here in Daniel chapter 10, we're, we're still discussing events that have taken place during the uh, timeline of Daniel chapter 6. Chapter 10, chapters 11 and 12 also make up one vision that was given to Daniel. These events are now taking place after the Persian Empire had been, been taken over by the, by the Medo-Persian Empire. If you'll remember back to the previous vision that Daniel had in chapter 8 of the ram, we can see that this is prophecy being fulfilled right before our eyes. Now, hear, hear what I'm saying here. This is... The Met, you had the Medo Persian Empire, they took over the Babylonian Empire, and now you've got the Persian Empire, which is actually growing stronger than, than the, the Mede Empire, the Median Empire. But this is prophecy being fulfilled right in front of our face from Daniel uh, chapter 8, verse 3. It says, Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. Verse 820 explains that ram and explains those horns and explains this prophecy that's being fulfilled in front of Daniel's eyes. Verse 20 says, The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. All right, so now we, we kind of understand what's happening here. We're inside of this, of this time period where the Persian Empire has, has grown stronger than the Median Empire. Now, at this point in Daniel's life, Daniel's an old man. He's... You can say he's retired from, from public service. If you'll go back to, to Daniel chapter 1, I'm going to flip back for it to us because I don't have this in my notes here. If you go back to Daniel chapter 1, let's see, I think we're in, in chapter 1. You know, I might be wrong about where it was at. Maybe it was chapter 3. Three. There's that. Maybe I'm just wrong altogether. There's a a verse here that tells us how long Daniel continued, and I'm not sure which verse it is. So I, I didn't write it down in my notes, but I want you to I want you to understand that Daniel's service really had already ended at this point. He was an old man. And it, the Bible tells us that he continued out into the first year of this particular king here. He continued out to the, the first year of, um, of the, the 
I'm losing my, my place. This is, I can't stand why I lose my nose. I can't stand it at all. I just want you, he's, he, they're talking about the first year of Cyrus is where Daniel's actual ruling of his, his service would have ended. I'm, I'll have to find the verse and bring it back to us here. But he, anyway, he's getting old. The point I'm getting to is he's getting old and he's been out of public service for a period of time here. Probably about two years he's been kind of set aside here. And when I think about getting old in ministry, when I think about what Daniel had going on here, you know, I'm looking at Tim right now. You know, one thing I would think about is Miss Dars. I mean, you know, she got old in ministry. Those cards kept on coming. So she kept she kept writing those those cards out, and sending them out. You know, I think about other people as too. I think about uh, I think about Brittany's granddaddy, Mr. Donnie. You know, he he was. If you would have asked him, he would have he would have told you that you know he was he was in his chair and couldn't get out of it. He he felt like he wasn't worth a whole lot, but he was he was worth a tremendous amount. He would he would pray for me. He would uh, he would help me help me go to seminary. He would he would had he had a ministry of prayer that where he prayed for all sorts of people. He's got they when they uh, take his iPad and they'll go back and look at he would take notes and have prayers written out for individual people that he would interact with. But I think back to when I was a kid growing up in, in Cedar Creek Baptist Church. I think back to two men in particular that had an impact on my life because they were older in ministry. I think back to, to Mr. Wallace Ganey. Now, in Cedar Creek, he would have sat right over here on the front row. And then I think, uh, I think of Mr., uh, Mr. Joe Crowley as well. Mr. Joe Crowley would have been back behind him a piece. Um, but Mr. Wallace, he was, he was up to some age. Like he, was, uh, he, I mean, he had got to the point where you know, you, he, he was just old is what it was. <laughs> But he was one of those funny old men. He was always laughing, always cutting up, always praying for people. I mean, Mr. Wallace, he, I, I can remember he, he would wear these, uh, these uh, coveralls. That's what he would wear to church, these blue coveralls. Um, not all the time, but most of the time, if you saw Mr. Wallace, that's what he was wearing. And he was praying, he'd pray for people. And I can remember he, he was such a wonderful, uh, wonderful prayer, prayer warrior. He would stand up in, in front of the church and he would, he would pray and pray and pray. And I, I can remember that. And I can remember Mr. Joe Crowley. Mr. Joe Crowley, I don't think I've ever seen the man when he didn't, he didn't come up and give me a hug or something, let me know that he'd been praying for me, ask how he could pray for me. And if anybody from, the, from Cedar Creek Church happens to watch this video, if they've been there for any amount of time, they know who Wallace Ganey, who's been passed away for a while, and they know who uh, Mr. Joe Crowley is. I can assure you that he, I, they they know, and they've been loved on by the people. There's not a pastor that's been in that church that hasn't been loved on. And I say that because, you know, they they didn't do this sort. They didn't just love on me because you know, well, maybe one day he'll preach a sermon and include me. They didn't have no idea that I was going to be preaching. They, they had no idea whatsoever. They knew me when I was a hoodlum. All right? And these men were still praying for me, still, still loving them. They had a wonderful, wonderful ministry. They were up in age. Their health wasn't great, but they kept you prayed up. Old age affected a lot, but it didn't affect them from ministering to people. Now, you might be here, here today or you might be watching by, by social media, and you might think that, that you're not qualified to minister to people. And that word minister, let me say that just means to serve. That means you're a servant. It doesn't mean to stand up here and preach. But, you know, people say, say well, minister such and such. Well, every one of you ought to be a minister to some degree, ministering to somebody at some level. But people think, well, based off of my age or my infirmities, I can't do what maybe I used to be able to do or somebody else needs to do this. Somebody else needs to be the one that's wearing out their knees praying, not me. I've done, I've done my time. That's just hogwash. That's what that is. That's absolute hogwash. You're never going to be too old or too young to minister to people. We all just watch Matthew. He wanted to pray for, he wanted to pray for his dad. Matthew's three years old, you know, walking out of the house. 
you know, I'm, I'm walking limping pretty good, leaning pretty hard. You know what you know what happens before we can go anywhere? Waylon has to stop me and say, Daddy, can I pray for you? Can I pray for your back? Is your back hurting? Where's your walking stick? Do you have it? He's sitting there trying to minister to me as a three year old and praying as a three you're not you're not gonna be too young to do it. You're not you're not gonna be in here and and say, well, you know, there's, there's other people in the church that ought to do this and this because they, they're older. They've got more wisdom on these certain things. That let, let them do it. And then you're not, you shouldn't be to the point where you say, well, there's younger people in the church. They should do this and this and this. And, you know, we can't, we can't do that. And I'm, I'm going to tell you what. Um, broke down and problems with his, uh, with his psychotic nerve last night. Problems with, with my back. Last night uh, we were sitting in the church. We were praying. Guess what? Two men that didn't have no business getting down on their on their hands and knees, <laughs> sitting down here in the floor praying, and you know it. That's how it, that's how it, it ought to be. We ought to be able to humble ourselves and do things. What Daniel had going on here, he was an old man. He'd been in he'd been in ministry for a long time. He had he had served he had served as a as a prisoner of war. He had served under multiple kings at this point. He, uh, he had the boldness to tell those kings what needed to be said. He had the boldness to stand up for the Word of God and stand up, stand up and be obedient to God at, throughout much of his life here. Most of it. All of it, really. I want you to think about something, though, especially as you're getting older in ministry. I want you to to think and get in this kind of mentality that Daniel had here. There's some believers that are out there. Daniel will be one of them. Many of the people you'll read about in the Bible are, are those. But there's still some believers even alive today that they'll be doing good long after they're dead and gone. They, they take Mr. Wallace and Mr. Joe and, and Donnie that I mentioned here. You take them. I've, a, I've been able to use them as sermon examples through over, throughout the years. I think this is the first time I've used Mr. Wallace and Mr. Joe, but they're great examples. There's, a, there's, def, there's definitely times that... You know, I've used, used, uh, used your mom several times because she's had a, a lasting impact. And you think about those, those men of God that, that led those other men of God to, to the Lord and they're still having impacts today based off of different things. You, you think about those, those men that actually uh, put, their, uh, put their writings to, to paper and wrote those books that some of these preacher boys get their hands on today. You know, that, that's, that's a good thing. And it's, they have a lasting ministry. So I want you to think about that. I want you to think about having something that will last after you're dead and gone. I want you to think about planting those seeds in your children and your family members so that when you're dead and gone, they're still out there serving the Lord. There's also the opposite of that. There's you planting seeds of ungodliness in them that could happen. And they can go out and they can, they can serve somebody besides the Lord. So you really need to be careful what we're doing with our children, what we're, how, we're, how we're being good stewards of our time, how we're being good stewards of the ministry opportunity that God's given us. And we're going to get into what Daniel's ministry opportunities, even as an old man, looked like here. Daniel chapter 10, verse 1 says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar, and the thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. So what I want you to notice here is that there's a thing being revealed to Daniel, and this revealing was a continued revealing of what's been taking place back in chapter 8. And look, look at 8 and 26, the Word of God says this, And the vision of the evening and the morning was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. So now here in chapter 10, we're picking back up on the vision that was given to him in chapter 8. And when Daniel first had this vision, he didn't understand it. But that didn't stop him from continuing to search Scripture. And it didn't stop him from continuing praying and asking God for understanding. Now, God doesn't always give you the understanding that you want immediately. 
I, I mean, I, I think everybody in here can, can own up to the fact that they've read a piece of Scripture and had no idea what it was talking about when they read it. It happens to me every single day. Every, every day that I read Scripture, I read something I don't understand. Every single day. I'm really thankful that Daniel didn't stop with uh, reading something one time and, and well, I, I don't get that, so... so Let's move on to something else here. No, Daniel kept seeking God for what he didn't understand. Daniel kept on searching the Scriptures out because God wants you to study His Word and God wants you to do something else that Daniel was doing and He wants you to be obedient to the Word that you do understand because if God's given you something and you understand this over here but you're not being obedient to it, what is the point in asking God for anything else? What, what's the point in saying, God, I need you, I need you to add more to my, to my ministry so, so, so I can not be faithful over here too? I, I think about, um, especially when you start thinking about you know, money and stuff like that. You know, well, if, if, the, if the Lord would just let me get a better job, I'd, I'd tithe more. Well, if you don't tithe with the job you have, you're probably not going to tithe when you have more money. Because you know what's going to happen? You're going to have more money and you're going to get more bills because you're going you're to start living a little bit nicer. Oh, if God, would just, if God would just give me my health back, I would do this, 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 and this. Well, you're just not doing nothing for him now. So what in the world does he need to give you more health for? Daniel, even with not understanding is still seeking God through all of this. Daniel had this first vision and he just he didn't understand it, but he, he keeps on seeking. He keeps he stays in the word. He stays in prayer. He stays obedient. And when it comes down to understanding scripture, there's a few things you need to avoid completely. Daniel avoided these things. And it'd be good for you to avoid them too. Don't be lazy. Don't be uncorrectable. Don't forget to pray and to petition God for the wisdom to understand this thing. If you, if you come with, oh God, please help me understand this. Oh, help me, help me, help me. Help me. Oh, amen. If I'm God, I'm going to ignore you. But if every single day you're praying for wisdom... For understanding, and if you when you when you want something bad enough, you're going to pray hard, and you're probably not going to get it immediately. I want a healthy family. I pray for them every day because it's important. You think I'm just going to go up one time and say, "Oh Lord, help help my family, let them let them all let them, everything be great and honky dory." Thank you, Amen, and never pray for them again. God, no. I'm going to pray for them. I've got an alarm set on my phone to remind me every day at 10.30 to pray for my family. I pick that time specifically because at 10.30, that's when restaurants start opening and Brittany starts getting hangry, so that's when she needs the most prayer is when, when it's almost lunchtime. I'm, I'm dead serious. I'm, that's why I pick that time. That, that's, that, that's, that's why, because 10.30 makes me think of Brittany and every time I think of Brittany, I want to think, well, what, how can I be praying for her today? That is a daily occurrence that happens because it's something I'm really petitioning God for. I pray for, I, I've, I've grown to praying for everybody in the church in particular at that time. I, 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 start, I start naming names and naming problems and dropping this and dropping that and taking it to God every day at 1030. Because, you know, every, this is just a time to remind me because I... You know, preachers forget to do things. Preachers forget to pray. Preachers forget to read their Bibles. Uh, evidently, preachers forget to click save when they type in something in their notes. I mean, it happens. We forget things. But don't be lazy. Don't be uncorrectable. And don't forget to pray and petition God. If you want wisdom, ask for it. 2 Timothy 2.15, here's another part of, of getting that wisdom. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You've got to put in the sweat equity into, 
into this book right here. If you want to, if you want to understand this book, you're going to have to read this book. You're going to have to take. You're going to have to believe things that are hard for you to believe at first. And when you believe that, when you place faith and trust in the Word of God, God will start revealing things to you. Now, Daniel, he was determined that he was going to seek after God no matter what happened. I mean, we, we know the stories of, of what Daniel's done there. We know the stories in the beginning of the, of the, the fasting. We know the, of, of just eating the, the pulps and water, just the, the beans and lentils and water for, for an over a three-year time period. We know that he was, he was dead set. He was going to be obedient. He knew to be obedient, and he was going to be obedient, and God blessed him for it. We know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who was going to be faithful no matter what happened, even in the fiery furnace. We know the story now of Daniel in the lion's den, who was going to be faithful no matter what. He was so faithful, he left the windows open. Let him come watch and pray when he was told that he couldn't pray to anybody other than, other than the, uh, the king at the time. He was going to be faithful. He continued being faithful. He was seeking God through obedience seeking God through fasting, seeking God through study. He was determined to seek after God. You think he read a little piece of Scripture? <laughs> and, Lord, well, give, give me understanding on it. And put it to the side and never touch it again. Well, that's what happens with most Christians. The majority of Christians, 95%, never read the Word of God. The other 5%, how many of you think read it more than once? Now you take these old... Uh, fellows like Daniel, who had at least the first five books of the Bible memorized. I mean, it's, it's absolutely incredible. I've seen Azariah in here being able to regurgitate Scripture. Uh, just recently, we had an a, a incident where, where somebody was reading Scripture that, that wasn't King James Scripture, and Brooklyn since there knows because that scripture she has memorized that that is not Bible. And she gets upset about it and, and says, hey, they're not reading out the Bible. And she, she was bound and determined that they weren't. And she was right. They were reading out of something else. They were, they were reading out of, out of a perverted version of the Bible. And Brooklyn was able to identify it based off of scripture that that she is memorized. When I'm going through Bible study, when, I, when, I, when I'm hearing something, when I see a, a sign in the church, I, you know, from time to time there'll be a, there'll be a sign that's, um, you know, maybe has some scripture on it. Like Hobby Lobby will have things, you hang them on the wall or whatever. Whenever Brittany will go to Hobby Lobby, she'll see something she likes. Like, oh, this will be nice. Let's hang it in the church. Now, her brain tells her, let me double check that this is King James because... Where, where I'm at, I might look at it and it may not have that scripture memorized, but I can look at it and tell you the language that it's written. This ain't King James right here. And I'll pull it up and say, sure enough, there, it's not. And it's, it's just a, a wonderful thing. Don't, don't be lazy. Study, 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 study. Daniel chapter 10, verses 2 through 3. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks are fulfilled. So Daniel's on this spiritual journey, and he's, now he's using a type of fasting along with prayer to act like a, a spiritual antenna to get him in tune with God. You know, funny thing about those... Those antennas, Tim. We were we were talking about this about you adjusting your mom's antenna, and this was just just hit me there. You know, you got to if you're younger, you might not remember. I think about everybody in here probably remembers adjusting an antenna at some point though. And you know, I was I was thinking about this thing between talking about that and trying to listen to the Gamecocks play on the radio last night. Um, it kept you know going in and out and it's, it's fading. You know you got to you got to be in tune. You know you got you got to do certain things. But there's times you got to get rid of certain things too if you want that antenna to work properly. Sometimes you got to cut a limb down to make that antenna pick up what you want it to pick up. Sometimes you got to move your truck about six inches so that it'll be far enough away from the basketball goal that the basketball goal is not interfering with the antenna on the truck so that you can hear the rest of the ball game. Sometimes you got to do that. Sometimes you got to cut things out of your life 
in order to get in tune with God. Because sometimes you've got things going on that are interfering with that. Daniel was aware of that. Daniel knew that he was going to draw his complete dependence from God. He cut out all of his pleasant bread, didn't drink any wine. We'll get into the, how that wine wasn't the wine of the day later on. But he cut things out completely. He went so far, he didn't even... It says here, um, I did not anoint myself at all. You know what that means? That, that means that Daniel didn't put on nothing that smelled good, no smell good, no colognes, no perfumes, no, no deodorants or whatever, no, nothing. He sat there and he, and he stunk to high heaven. I mean, you're out in the Middle East in the desert, it's hot. No deodorant, no nothing, no, no pleasant bread, no, no yeast rolls, no Texas Roadhouse rolls, no, no nothing. No, uh, what are them Mountain Dews you're drinking now, Sandy? None of them. None, none of them. No Diet Pepsis. Nothing. He's, he's sitting here on this diet of unleavened bread and water for three weeks. Daniel knew that what he needed to consume was the Word of God. He knew he needed to seek God. Matthew 4 and 4 but he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now Daniel never got a chance to hear that scripture. He never got a chance to read that because he, that, was a, that was several hundred years, uh, written several hundred years after he lived. But what that scripture refers to, what Jesus referred to here, was, uh, and what Daniel would have had memorized would have been Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 through 3. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, to know, that wo to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep His commandments or no. And He humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know that He might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live." So Daniel had that memorized. Daniel goes into this, this mode of fasting here. He goes into this, this mode of, of getting rid of, of things that are interfering with, with him trying to get in tune with God. And I want to tell you something. When you're looking for God, God will show up. Daniel chapter 10, verse 4 through 6. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hittichel, this is the Tigris River today, by the way, then I lifted up mine eyes, and I looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in, in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of, of Uphaz. His body was also like the barrel, and his, that's a stone, not a, not a barrel. He's not, not, a, not a fat fellow here. This is, he's a glowing yellow stone here. And his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. So God shows up to Daniel here, and God shows up as what's known as a Christophany. This is a, this is a, a pre-incarnate Jesus Christ coming on the scene here. This description to Jesus here matches the description of Him given in Revelation 1, Matthew 17, Luke 9, and Revelation 19. We're going to read those scriptures. This is the match here. We know we're talking about Jesus. Revelation 1, 13 through 15 says, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a with golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Matthew 17 and 2. And I was transfigured, and, and, excuse me, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was as white as the light. Luke 9, 29. As he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistening. Revelation 19 and 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Daniel has seen Jesus here. This is the, these are the New Testament descriptions of what Daniel saw in the Old Testament. He's seen Jesus. He's seen Him as the mighty God 
that he is. He's seen him in his transfigured form at this point. And this is a type of the, the second advent of Jesus Christ. This is a type of, of Christ revealing himself to the Jews. This would be a wonderfully terrible sight to see. This would have been something that would have put fear inside of Daniel, but it would also have been wonderful at the same time. Men that know God, when they have an encounter with God, they will fall down and worship Him. Men that don't know God will run and flee from Him. And that, that's even if you start looking at, at Scripture itself. You want to sit there and, and go, some, go somewhere in public and start reading some Scripture out loud. You'll get to some points where men will want to run from it. They'll want to shut you down. They don't want to hear it. That's what lost men will do. Men, men that are men of God, they'll sit there and they'll want it lifted up. I, I can remember down in Florida, I went to go visit my friend Billy at his, uh, at his t-shirt shop there in Florida. He's got a print shop. Went to go visit him. Walked past some Jehovah's Witnesses at their table and you know, started uh, proclaiming the God of the Bible to them. And they wanted, they wanted me shut down. They, they turned on vacuum cleaners to drown me out. Turn them on. They wanted me to shut down. They, there was people looking at me with disgust. And then this man come up to me, put his hands on me, and started praying. And, started, and he, he had whispered in my ear, he says, he says, son, I used to be caught up in that cult. He said, keep preaching. Keep, keep proclaiming the Word of God. Um, hopefully they'll see it. And he sit there and he starts praying for the Holy Spirit just to, just to take over that thing. And I'm telling you what, I have Scripture come to memory right then and there that I can't... Even today, I can't sit here and just regurgitate it. But I mean, I had it come back and I was able to jump to this scripture, jump to that scripture. And I, and, and I knew where I was at while I was doing this. And it was, it was a wonderful thing because it was the Holy Spirit was having its will and way in that moment there. And they're trying to drown it out. We're having an encounter with God and men would flee from it. Verses 7 and 10. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. This is, this is what the lost folks want to do here. Therefore I was left alone, and I saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the voice of His words... And when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face and my face toward the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. Today, there's books, movies, and cults that are formed around men who have claimed to have had interactions with God. You've got movies like Heaven is for Real. Heaven's for real, but that movie's not. That movie is garbage. That movie is anti-scriptural. The people that wrote the book that the movie's based off of, the guy, the, the, the pastor that wrote the book, actually come out and admitted to it and repented of writing that book because it was garbage. Then you got movies like The Shack. Garbage. Garbage, garbage, garbage. Zero Bible. And I mean, they, they, they took, I say zero, they take just enough to get, you, to get you lured in, to make you think, oh, this is of God. But it, it ought not be called the shack. It ought to be called the religious crack house because that's what it is right there. It is nothing but spiritual dung. It is garbage. But these, these books, these religions... They're written by con artists who are trying to make a dime off of emotions. They're, they're made up of stories that are getting closer to promoting the devil and promoting devil worship than they do of promoting a holy God. In fact, they're just taking a page out of, out of Satan's playbook, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, And no marvel, for Satan himself transformed into an angel of light... That's what they're trying to do here. They try to, they try to take advantage of Christians who are lazy. They try to take advantage of Christians who have no work or study ethic when it comes down to, when it comes down to Scripture. And guess what? They will do it. 
time and time and time again. And they'll use somebody you trust to do that. They'll use you to do that to children. They'll do it. Satan knows exactly how to get you to do it. People go so far as to create entire religions around the lie that God's come to them with some type of divine revelation. Those men are they're false prophets. And the gods that they worship are not the same God that we worship, not the same God of the Bible. And you may, you may have heard the old saying that the devil's in the details. And if you ever want to test whether something's of God or not, it's the details you'll need. It's the details you'll need to pay attention to. You'll be needing to test to find out if something's fabricated or not. You need to ask yourself these questions when you're hearing something, especially when you're watching a movie like that. Does it line up with Scripture or does it not? The answer to that question rules out the false god of Islam, Allah, because Allah had no son. That god doesn't line up with the god of the Bible. God had a son and his name is Jesus Christ. So what about Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses? So they, they believe in Jesus Christ. That's right. They believe in Jesus Christ, just not the Jesus Christ of the Bible. To be correct, they believe in a false version of Jesus Christ. They make up attributes. They give Him things to make Him unholy. They take away things to make Him unholy. They take away His equality with God. They take away the fact that He's a... a, a they take away his, his birth. They take away the virgin birth. They take away many things. They even make him brothers with Satan. They're adding things to Jesus and trying to tell you that he's the Jesus of the Bible. You want to, um, you want to question those people on, on whether they have the right Jesus or not? Get the details right. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God born of a virgin? They're going to tell you no. They don't believe that. But you can go to their you can go to their website. You can read it for yourself. You can go you can go and just ask their elders what they believe in. It's not scripture. Period. They're not the same Jesus. It's masquerading as Jesus. Remember, the devil's in the details. And simply put, this is cases of Satan trying to masquerade as God. These con artists, they claim to have met God, but they sure didn't respond in the same way that those in Scripture did. Moses, when he met God, he couldn't even look at God. Paul was blinded on the road to Damascus. He was blind for three days. The men here with Daniel, they fled and hid into the mountains because they couldn't look at God. Daniel just laid flat on his face, lifeless. There was no breath in him. Daniel 10, 11 and 14. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright. For unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Now this is how Daniel responds. He's sitting there shaking. He's just been laying on the ground prostrate, not, not even being able to breathe, couldn't, look, couldn't even look. And now God sets him up. And he's sitting there still trembling. God's having to tell him not, not to fear. Verse 11 also says to us that Daniel's greatly beloved. And this isn't the only time we read this about Daniel. We see it again in verse 19. We saw it last week in chapter 9, verses 9, 23. Well, chapter 9, verse 23 says, At the beginning of thy supplications the commandment came forth, and I came to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. I want you to pay attention there. He says, Thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand the matter and consider the, consider the vision. Part of this reason that Daniel is going to be able to understand this and receive this vision is because he's greatly beloved. And it's, it's important for us to realize this. When someone's beloved by God, things get revealed to them. I want you to take John the Apostle, for example. He was beloved by Jesus Christ, and the revelation was given to him. And if you're a born-again believer, whether you're in here today or watching by social media, if you're a born-again believer, then you're beloved by God as well. 
You're His adopted child. You're a joint heir with Christ. And I went, guess what? God has the, soul, the, the Holy Spirit setting on ready to reveal something to you about Himself. All you have to do is read and study His Word and ask for understanding and continue to ask for understanding. Let's look at what Daniel does in the next verse now and pay attention to, to how you should seek the Lord. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand that what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. So Daniel has, just in this time period, Daniel's been seeking God for 21 days. I mean, he's been, he's been fasting here. But he, God's been listening to his prayers for a quite a long period of time now. Now he's, he's fasting. He's getting really serious about wanting to understand this. And it takes 21 days for God to come to reveal this thing to him. Don't think just because you pray something one time that God's coming right when you want. Don't think that at all. And don't think it's going to be 21 days that you're going to go out. Don't think it's going to be 40 days of purpose. You believe that garbage? They, they, they just, oh, I hope to God y'all don't believe any of that garbage and just, just believe what the Word says. There's been spiritual warfare going on here for Daniel for these three weeks, or his whole life, but these three weeks in particular. Verse 13, it speaks of that spiritual warfare in a, in a physical sense for us. Now, Daniel's been seeking God and pray, through prayer and study for quite a while. You could say that uh, it'd, be, it'd be a fair statement say that Daniel's been standing outside the gates of heaven beating on the door waiting on God to answer. You could, you could give you that vigil there. Now, God's getting ready to reward Daniel's diligence here. You ever... Uh, you ever want something and you're just bound and determined that you're not going to stop until you get it? Or you know, something's just that important to you. You can't, you can't quit with it. You're, you're dead set. Uh, you're, you might die, but this is going to happen. Ever be like that? I had, a, uh, I had an incident happen a few days ago. We, when we go through drive throughs I have to be in the driver's seat because Brittany doesn't like to... Um, she doesn't like to talk to the drive through because we have so many people, she doesn't want to be the responsible one for when something's wrong uh, on the order. And let's, let's face it, if it ain't Chick-fil-A in Lancaster, that order's probably going to be wrong when you go through that window. I mean, and Chick-fil-A, you know, they, they better pick up their game too because they've, they've messed me up a time or two recently. We were coming back from a, uh, from a ball practice up in Indian land. It was hot, it was thirsty. Wanted something to eat, wanted something to drink, and um, you know it was late. Didn't want, want there's not enough time to go home and, and cook at this point. The kids need to eat and go to bed. We're like, all right, let's go to McDonald's. So we made that we made the bad judgment call to go to McDonald's in the middle of the night in Lancaster. So we pull through the line, and we're sitting there. the The biggest thing I wanted was a drink. I just wanted this drink. So we're sitting there, sitting and sitting and sitting. Line is not moving. There's nowhere else to go. I don't go on the gas stations in Lancaster except for the Circle K because you got to deal with flat drinks, and I'm just not dealing with that. So we're sitting there. About 20 minutes pass. We decide we're going, you know, we're going to get some food, get some, get these drinks. The lady tells first off when she comes on the the thing at the McDonald's here, she's rude. Great day. What do you want? Well, I like to order. Um, our drink machine's not working. I haven't ordered a drink yet, but that's really what I want. And I, I looked at Brittany and I said, well, do you still want to get out? Let's just get some food and go get a drink at the house. We'll just, we'll just have to wait till we get home. But we're going to get the food anyway. So we, we sit there and I, I say, yeah, I, I like a McDouble. No, is that all? Well, no, I got a whole carload of people here. Let me get my whole order out, right? So we go through this whole order. 
And, you know, I'm, I'm very meticulous about it because, you know, I got to have no onions. Brooks got to have nothing but ketchup on her cheeseburger. And, you know, we got to have the right amount of nuggets and the right amount of fries for everybody. And there's already no drinks. So I have them read the order back to me. And they read the order back and, and she got it. Perfect. All right. We go to get the, we get the food. We pay for it. Rub, you know, go to the first window and then we're at the second window to pick the food up. And I tell Brittany, check this order, make sure it's right. Starts checking it, missing her french fries. So I tell the lady, hey, I'm missing the french fries. So you didn't pay for them. I look at the receipt. Sure enough, I didn't pay for them. But the girl read the, read the order back to me. It was on there. She even remembered it. She said, oh, yeah, he ordered it. I should put it on there. Oh, sir, you're going to have to come in. Well, no, just, just ring them up here. It's fine. Nope, you're going to have to come in. I'm like, no, I'm not. Well, you're not going to be able to get those fries. <laughs> well, let me talk to your manager. The manager's not going to do anything about it. I said, really? Put it in park in the driveway. Wait, right there, right there at the window. And I just looked at him. I said, I've got all the time in the world. And Brady said, oh, Lord. I, here we go. And I, I just sat there and I looked at him with a smile on my face. Uh, a couple seconds later, here comes a brown bag with a large order of fries in it. Have a nice night. All right? I, they didn't charge me for them. I, got, I wound up getting them for nothing, but they read, they read, this was their fault now. I offered to pay for it. They didn't want to take the payment. I wound up getting them for free. I drove off. I was determined that I was leaving with what I wanted. It was going to happen. And I think about that, and I'm thinking, well, how does, you know, how does that uh, apply to my, my, my Christian walk here? You know, I'm, I'm a local preacher here, and the last thing I need is for somebody to say, well, he was being a jerk at McDonald's. No, I just put it in park at McDonald's because I wasn't leaving until I got, the, got, what I, got what I was asking for. We need to treat God the exact same way. You need to put it in park, and you need to stay there until God gives you what you're asking for. When if it's understanding you're asking for, now I'm not saying hold your hand out and ask for all kind this miracle and that miracle, but when it comes down to understanding His word, you put it in park. You set your will to be determined that you're not leaving until God gives it to you. And you ever know, you ever know sometimes He might give it to you for free. He might just He might just throw it in there. You might get a you might get a little, it might not be a golden nugget or, or whatever, but you might, you might get something that you weren't even asking for from God, and he'll reward that thing. Now, what Daniel's done here, he's, he's given, God's given him this vision. He's given him understanding of the thing. Now, this vision is going to continue out for the next couple of chapters here. Daniel chapter 10, verses 15 through 21. I'm, I'm going to wrap up quickly because this is where my notes got deleted at. And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground and I became dumb. And I became one like the similitude of the sons, uh, and behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. For how can thy servant, how can the servant of this, of this my Lord talk with this, my Lord, for as for me, straightway there remained no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. Then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me, and said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not, peace be unto thee, but be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened, and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee, and now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia? And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Gracia shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in the Scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. So what we've got here is we've got Daniel. He's had this vision. Christ is, is giving him something here, but what he's showing him, he's going to be able to show him through Scripture. Now this is actually the first time in Scripture that you see the word Scripture. 
He says, but I'll show thee that which is noted in the Scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things. He's going to give him his word. He's going to... He's going to give him understanding here because that's what Daniel's really seeking. He's seeking understanding. He's seeking the Lord. And God will give you those things as well if you'll seek in the same ways, in the, in the same manner here, and truly do it, and truly mean it when you're seeking God. He'll give you incredible understanding. And we've got something here. We've got the Word of God that's settled in heaven. So what Daniel is here, and you, keep in mind, I told you last week, Daniel wasn't, he didn't have the originals. The originals have been burned up. We got to see that in the book of Jeremiah. He didn't, he didn't have the originals. He had something better than that. He had, he had what was in front of him right then. He had something that was preserved for him at the time period. Now what Daniel had is gone for us today. Now we've got something that's preserved for the entire world, for... For all time here, we've got that thing. And we need to be seeking God diligently. We need to seek Him with everything that we have. We need to get rid of the distractions that are out there and seek after the Lord, and He will find us. We need to pull up to the gates of heaven, beat on the door, and put it in park. Y'all know that country song about shining the lights through the, uh, through the window? It, it, we need to be like we need to we need to go get whatever we can get from God however we've got to get it and i'm going to tell you what you're not going to get anything if you don't come through this word god's not going to give you any divine revelation if you haven't come through his word this is all the divine revelation you need that illiterate pedophile muhammad did not come through the Word of God. And look at how messed up he got. He got, he got the angel Gabriel with 600 wings. No angel has wings in the Bible, but he had a 600 wing angel choking him to death. That's what he deserved. Angel should have squeezed a little bit harder. But if he had come through Scripture, he would have found the God of the Bible. Now, my notes, my notes ran out. But I can tell you what's not going to run out. Love of God is not going to run out. God's wisdom is not going to run out. But you can be too lazy to be given any of God's wisdom. You can, you can not study. You can do the opposite of 2 Timothy 2.15. You can not study to show yourself approved. You could not do those things, and God won't give you anything, and you wouldn't deserve anything. If I'd have, if I'd have pulled off from that, uh, from that McDonald's window and, and then got home and didn't have any fries, guess whose fault it would have been that I didn't have any french fries? It would have been my fault. But I'm going to tell you what, you got to, you got to have that determined, you got, to, you got to be so determined that you're going to get something from God, and then he'll, he'll do it. There's one thing that you don't have to, uh, to worry about, though. You don't have to worry about whether, uh, whether you're saved or not. You don't have to worry about those things because God's Word is faithful. All you've got to do in that matter is believe the Gospel. All you've got to do is believe that Jesus Christ, the same Jesus Christ that, that Daniel saw here, you've got to believe that He was that Son of God. You've got to believe that He was born of that virgin. You've got to believe that He died on the cross of Calvary for your sins. You've got to believe that He was, he was buried and rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. If you can believe that, it can be settled. Outside of believing that, nothing's going to be settled, and you're not going to get any type of, of revelation from God because you know who God gives that to? What I said earlier, those that are beloved. That's how you, that's how you know that you're, uh, you're qualified to get something from God is because you're a child of God. You're beloved by Him. So would you take that for, out from here today, know that, you're, know that you're His child and know that you should seek after Him and don't stop seeking Him don't ever stop seeking Him. But if you don't know Him, you better get it settled. You better get it settled today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll, we'll get out of here. Father God, Lord, we come to You, Lord, today in the name of Jesus, Lord, in the name of all names. God, first off, I thank You for notes. Lord, I, I thank You that it, for when they, when they work out. God, I, Lord, but I thank You for, for Your Scripture, Lord. I thank You for it being preserved, God. I thank, I thank You for where I might mess up, Lord, your word's not messed up, Lord. Lord, we just ask you, God, to, to be with us, Lord, 
as we go throughout this week. Lord, we ask you to, to be with us as we, as we come back in here next week, Lord, to, to hear the message that you give Brother Tim, Lord. We just ask you that you to minister to him this week, God, Lord, and just let your Holy Spirit just, just cover him and fill him, God, and let him bring your word from your book to your people, God. Lord, we thank you for all that you do, but most of all, we thank you for sending your Son to die on the cross for our sins. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.